All right, amen. Welcome to Paradigm, our last Paradigm of April. We have May, I believe, is on Saturday or Sunday, something like that's coming up. Can everyone believe that it's already May of 2016? Is anyone else as blown away as I am that it has been four months, five months now since 2016 has started, so much has happened, and here we are three paradigms away from the end of the semester. Uh, but welcome. How many first-timers do we have? Any first-timers in the house? Oh, cool. By now, sweet. All right. Well, if you then you've been here before, you know what we are about to check in. So if you want to go ahead and grab your phone out or your iPad or send in the Dove, however you guys want to do that, the check-in for tonight. There's two options for tonight's message. Uh, the one option, the first option, is if you're more deeper in theolo theology, then then you can do this one. If you like Star Wars, you can do the second one. The first one is this: I am known by God. Okay, I am known by God. You can check in at Paradigm Bible Study on our Facebook page. I am known by God. The other one is I know. And if you're a fan of Star Wars, then you understand what I'm talking about. But you've got those two options there. I know and I am known by God. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. But before I go into that, let me introduce myself. My name is Ty Kinderman. I'm one of the university interns here at First Baptist. Excited to be here. Uh, I only have one paradigm left after this one. I leave in a week to go off to student life camps to work for them for the fourth summer. So I will not be with y'all on that last paradigm. But y'all have some great interns coming up. And you'll get to meet them officially within the next week or so. Uh, but I'm excited to be here. This is my last time to preach before the Lovett crowd, and uh, it's a little bit of an emotional night, so if I cry, you can judge me. Don't judge me. I'm not going to cry. I'm just kidding. But before we go into it, I want to tell you all a little story. All right, and this is a story, about, a story about a young man who grew up with Christian parents, grew up in a Christian household. And so he, he went around the church a lot. He knew the church. He was familiar with what the church looked like and the makeup of the church and how, how the church worked and everything. He went to church every Sunday, every Wednesday night to Awanas. If anyone knows what Awanas is, awesome. In his words, he put it, uh, Awanas is Boy Scouts for Jesus or Girl Scouts for Jesus, the way, however you want to look at that, because you got the vest and, and you do the, the games. And if you've been to an Awana arena, they have those weird like Velcro tape thing that makes a square and there's all these different colors and there's kids running around, it's chaotic. But it's great because they teach kids about the scriptures. And so this kid, this young man is growing up, he's going to Awana's every single Wednesday night and that's where he found the, the, Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, that's where he found faith. And he goes to Juan as he's finding faith, he starts getting into the Word and discovers that this idea of getting into the Word, this idea of gaining knowledge, is something that he really likes. He likes memorizing the scriptures because, well, when you're in second grade, as he was, Awanas equals Monopoly money, Monopoly money equals hubba bubba bubble gum, hubba bubba bubble gum then equals Jesus, right? Because, do you see how it tracks there? Uh, so he's like, okay, I'll memorize scripture because then I can get more candy. So he starts diving into the word a lot, starts diving into the scriptures a lot, and, and he really had a passionate moment of faith, but he started getting into this more legalistic prescription faith, is what he likes to call it. It was a prescription faith. You just pop the pill every morning, and you'll be good for that day. You check it off, and you're okay, right? He starts growing up in the church. Again, godly parents, they're always with him. They're very passionate parents. They still, though, at that time, had more of a legalistic faith, and we'll get to where his parents go. Uh, but they, he's growing up, they switch churches, he starts becoming into the youth group, right? And so if you ever grew up in the church, you knew that once you could hit like sixth grade to be in the youth group, that was the best thing ever. And he loved it. He loved being in the youth group. And that's where he found his identity. He found his identity and what people thought of him in the youth group, right? He was popular. Everyone liked him. If you asked him to pray, he'd raise his hands, which if anyone has ever taught a sixth grade Bible study, that's the hardest thing in the world. Would anyone like to pray? And it's silent. All right, I will. Okay. And that's what it was like. He was the guy, though. If you, if you wanted someone to pray, yes, this kid. If you wanted someone to answer the question, yes, this kid. And he started even seeing in his parents, though, a more passionate faith and the prescription faith. In sixth grade, his mom, going into seventh grade, was cooking something at the house. And it caught fire. And his mom got third-degree burns up her arm, under her chest, onto her face. And that was the moment that his parents really started to have this passionate faith. They started understanding what it meant to live for God because they were realizing they were living this American dream where both are working, you never see your kids, you travel all the time, you have this great house, you're in the nice district, but they neglected their faith. They pushed it to the side. They, they, they were satisfied with the prescription faith. And so now, going into seventh grade, going into eighth grade, where he was still living this prescription faith, where it didn't matter what he did on Tuesday night, as long as it was Wednesday night, he was at church, he saw his parents getting up at 5 a.m., 6 a.m., and reading the Word. Never seen that before. 
didn't really know how to understand that, but just figured that was once you hit 30, 35, that's what you did, right? So fast forward a few years, we're going into high school. And by now, of course, you know, this young man has, um, you know, he's, he's, he's understood the faith even a little more. He's gotten more popular at church, more popular at school and everything. Uh, but he's gotten into more sin, more pride, more arrogance, more lies, more lust. But it didn't matter because, you know, he, he was living the prescription faith. And so when you're sick, you take a pill. And so when you sin, you read the word and you move on. Eighth, uh, going into his 10th grade year, though, he's in band. He's a band nerd, and he's, he's starting off band camp, and he goes into it. He finishes band camp. Friday night, he gets home. He goes to bed, and he wakes up in the middle of the night with the most intense pain he's ever experienced in his life. There's this gut-wrenching pain in his stomach. He starts sweating. He's throwing up all night. He can't keep anything down. He has a migraine. He's aching all over. All, all day Friday night, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, this is happening. Nothing is working, not ibuprofen, nothing. His parents don't know what to do, so eventually Monday, they take him to the hospital. Doctor says, oh, you're just dehydrated. Here's some IV. And he gained color back and went home. And again, he goes home and he's, he's throwing up and he's in this pain and he has this migraine and nothing is working. And so Tuesday, they go back to the doctor. The doctor says, you should probably go get a CAT scan, son. And then they go get a CAT scan. And of course, if any of you are in the medical field, when it's a stomach issue, you get in pretty quickly. They arrive to the CAT scan machine. He's in the hospital with a waiting room. They get in like literally within five minutes, he says. And they go back and they start doing the contrast stuff. He can't keep it down at all, and he gets into the CAT scan machine. And so this is where we're going to pause the story, and we're going to go back to this idea of being known by God. So if you have your scriptures, please open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to be looking at 1 through 3 first. We have a few scriptures tonight, not as many as the marathon of February, if you were here with that. So if you're taking notes, you can actually uh, write down all of these. But 1 Corinthians chapter 8, point number one. You are known by God. God knows you. So let's read here 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. I'm going to read from the Holman Christian Standard. It says, About food offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge inflates with pride, but love builds up. If anyone thinks he knows anything, he does not know it as he ought to know it. But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. So first, let's get a little bit of context of Corinthians. What's going on here? Of course, Corinthians was written by Paul to the church in Corinth, to the Corinthians. He's talking about some divisions in the church. He's addressing these ideas, this idea of increasing contention in the church. And we see that throughout the early moments of Corinthians. There was all these divisions in the church. We think we need to go this way. We think we know to go this way. Well, we know we need to go this way. And Paul's addressing them. And one of the moments is this idea of he's also addressing questions that they have these problems. And one of the problems here, as we see, is the idea of food to idols. Now, that, that's not what we're talking about tonight. So if you're interested in that point in the context here, you can look up Romans chapter 14, 1 through 15, 3, and read more about what Paul is talking about in food to idols. But the highlight verse that I want us to look at is verse 3 here, this idea that, but if anyone loves God, he is known by him. What does that mean? We're going to look at the Amplified Version for this. If you ever read the Amplified Version, it's basically its own walking commentary. It's wonderful. Uh, it reads like, I think, so I, I always enjoy it. But the Amplified Version says this, If anyone loves God truly, with affectionate reverence, prompt obedience, and grateful recognition of his blessing, he is known by God, recognizes worthy of his intimacy and love, and he is owned by him. And so here's the idea of being known by God, that we are recognized as worthy of his intimacy and love and owned by him. But before we break that down a little bit further, let's see there's even more context within scriptures of this idea of being known by God. Galatians 4, 8 through 11. I'll give you a moment to flip there. We see another moment of Paul again talking about being known by God. Now, the context of Galatians, while you're flipping there, is similar. They were pushing for a uh, significance of the law, this idea of legality. A lot of what Galatians is talking about is the idea that they wanted Jesus plus something. We have the circumcision party and the non-circumcision party, and they want Jesus plus circumcision, or no, 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 it's Jesus plus not circumcision. You have to live this way. And Paul's trying to get it through their thick skulls that it's just Jesus. That is simply it. The simplicity of the gospel. And as they're running away from it, we, we fall into Galatians 4 here. Verses 8 through 11, but it says this. But in the past, when you didn't know God, you were enslaved to things that by nature are not God's. 
But now, since you know God, or rather have become known by God, how can you turn, a back, how can you turn your back against the weak and bankrupt elemental forces? Do you want to be enslaved to them all over again? You observe special days, months, seasons, and years. I'm fearful for you that perhaps my labor for you has been wasted. And so our two focus verses here are Corinthians chapter 8, verse 3, and Galatians 4, 9. This idea of being known by God. Again, if you're interested in the Amplified Version, it just blows it up a little bit more. But we're going to go into breaking this idea of being known, which is really, it's a sense of complete and absolute understanding to be known. On God's part, what is known is of value to the one who knows. We are the one that is known, and God is the one who knows. Therefore, we are of value importance to God. From the beginning, from the get-go. In the Greek, the word is, and you can say this with me, it's gnosko. Say that with me. Gnosko. Gnosko, which I really think sounds like geonosis for some reason. I think I got Star Wars on the brain uh, because when I like, looked up the pronunciation, I had to hear it like six times before I stopped saying geonosis. I'm like, it's gnosko, which is this idea of experiential knowledge, experiential knowledge. And it's not merely the accuma- uh, accumulation of knowledge, it's like just getting and gaining and gaining and gaining. It's, it's experience. This experiential knowledge, to know, to completely ascertain, to understand, to have intimate relationships with another, to become known. That, that's this idea of gnosko, and that's what Paul is talking about here in both aspects of Galatians 4.9 and Corinthians 8.3. That you are known by God. You are gnosko by God. God knows you, God loves you, and you are known by God. And this isn't even the only time we see it. David in Psalms 139 talks about this. Um, It's a wonderful passage. We're not going to read the whole chapter, but the whole chapter is really talking about this idea of him being known by God. Verses 1 and 2 of Psalms 139 says this, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You understand my thoughts from far away. And then verses 13 and 14 says this, For it was you who created my inward parts, you who knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know this very well. Again, so David understood this idea that God knew him. He was known by God from the very beginning. From before he was even created, before he was knitted in his mother's womb, he was known by God, cherished by God, and loved by him. And there's been no action at this point by any means on on David, on Paul, on anyone. It is just the simple truth that you are of value and importance of God. Before you were born, before you had any knowledge about or of God, you were known by him. N.T. Wright summarizes it this way in his commentary on 1 Corinthians 8. What matters is God's knowledge of you, and the way you will be aware of that is by the love. Remember the love from 1 Corinthians. Again, we'll break that up. Love, the affectionate reverence, prompt obedience, and grateful recognition of his blessing. Is be aware that uh, is by the love that you find for this true God deep in your own heart and mind. So first we have this idea that God is known or you are known by God, and then we understand that this concept of knowledge is introduced, and it's not that knowledge necessarily is the thing that goes to our relationship. We'll talk about this in a few minutes. It's more this love concept that Wright is talking about. Another commentator said that there is knowing God and being known by God, and the latter is the source of the former. That to be known by God is the source of knowing God. Matthew Henry said this, all of our knowledge of God begins on his part. We know him because we are known by him. And so all of this directs our attention towards whom? Towards God. It's because this makes God the source of our love, God the source of our relationship with him, God the source of our knowledge and our knowing him. He is the one who opens the door. He is the one that through the cross bridges the gap that we have this opportunity to know him. So that's point number one. You are known by God. Point number two is this idea of knowledge about God. That is, you can know God. You can have knowledge about God. Similar to the story I shared earlier, the young man through Awanas gained lots of knowledge of God. Now when the young man was born, we understand from the point that we just shared that he was known by God. And as he gained knowledge of the Lord, he started to understand who God was. He understood the story, he learns his name, he gets the Bible scriptures, he starts understanding them. And many of us today in this room have knowledge of the Lord, that's why we're here. We're here at church to gain knowledge of God, right? We want to grow in that. We want, to, we want to know him. We want to understand him. But knowing God, to know God, is more than just knowledge. Our knowledge is, of God is small, feeble, and partial. It seems to go up and down with our moods and feelings. If that was the thing that made us Christians, our knowledge of God, we would be building on a very shaky foundation. 
What matters is that God has known us, not just in the sense that he knows about us, but from his own side of the relationship, established a bond, a covenant, in which he knows us through and through and names us as his own. Again, 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 2, we talked about this, the idea that Paul introduces that knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. This is prescription faith that the young man was having in his life at the early age. It's this pharisaical faith that the Pharisees had. They knew all the scriptures. They knew how to go about them. They knew the rights and the wrongs. They understood it. They had all this knowledge, but they never knew the Lord. They missed him. It is not through knowledge alone that we know God at all. The other side of that, point three, is this idea of you can know God. So I know we're understanding the English language here has the same word for every single thing, so we're going to break it down here in a few minutes. But I want you to understand the difference between the knowledge of God and knowing God. Remember, to, to know God, this is the genosco part. This is to experience him. This is to have an intimate relationship with him. This is to have this moment of understanding and ascertaining with him. This isn't just to simply know someone. For example, I know about Peyton Manning. I'm a Broncos fan. I know about Peyton Manning. I don't know all his stats, but I know about him. I don't know Peyton Manning. Or if you're Michael Hartsfield, you know about the Mavs. You love the Mavs. You talk about the Mavs. And you don't know the Mavs, you never met them, and he doesn't know them in the playoffs anymore, so. <laughs> too soon, too soon, Michael? Sorry, bro, I had to. So it's that idea that knowledge doesn't necessarily mean relational experience. We can know all about someone, all about our famous stars, we can follow them on Twitter, follow them on Snapchat, follow them on Facebook, whatever things else there is, smoke signals. But when you meet them, you're still gonna have to say, hello, my name is because you don't know them. There isn't that relationship yet. And that's the difference between knowing about God, that knowledge, and knowing God. To truly know God, this, this is where the belief comes in. This is the faith part of it. This is accepting the knowledge of God that you have gained as fact. This is faith. One commentator said, denoting nothing less than that divinely imparted invitation of God, that consciousness of his actual being, when viewed in our relationship to ourselves, which is the result of believing in him. So through the invitation of the Lord that is imparted upon him to have a relationship with him, that comes from us taking this consciousness that we gain and believing it. And this is what Jesus prayed for. This is what he wanted from us. In John 17, 3, one of the passages of, of Jesus praying is a great passage full of amazing things. And the first three verses say this. Jesus spoke these things, looked up to the heavens and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. For you gave him authority over all flesh so that he may give eternal life to all you have given him. This is eternal life, that they may know you the one true God, and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. So even Jesus was praying that we would know him, that we would know God through him, that we would have this relationship with him, that we would gnosko him, that we'd have this experiential moment, this intimacy of the relationship that we can have through Jesus because of the cross. He wanted that for us. He wanted that relationship for us. He didn't want us to simply just know about him. He didn't want us just to know the answers to the test. He didn't just want us to know us to memorize some Wikipedia page about him. He wanted to experience relationship with us. That's because from the very beginning of time, we understood that God knew us. God loved us us. God cherished us. And then you'll understand that he's like, okay, finally now you, you hear the things about me. You hear my name. You come to this moment where you can make a decision and you can now decide, do you want this with me? Do you want to experience this with me? Or do you simply just want to have this knowledge? This is where we understand the difference between all three. So we have God knows you. You are created. You are formed. You have been known by God. We have that you can know God, there's this knowledge of him, you can learn about him, his story and his name, and once you get that second one, it presents a choice. You can either choose to accept that as fact and believe it and have faith and begin and step into this idea of knowing God in a relationship with him, or you cannot. Now, side note, choosing this not side to, to not believe that doesn't change the fact that the truth is true. Our perception of truth doesn't change the reality of what is true. For example, or, or, or even on another note, our understanding of the truth doesn't change the reality of what is true. For example, I don't understand how when I breathe in, oxygen comes in, but carbon dioxide comes out. 
I am not a science major. I don't even know what major would study that. I study dead things. I don't understand it. Does that mean that for me, because I don't understand it and I can't comprehend it, that it's not true and I breathe some magical fairy dust because that makes more sense to me? I wish, that'd be cool. No. There's so many things in the scripture, and this is just a tangent moment here. There's so many things in the scripture that we are never meant to understand. Listening to a pastor preach a, a little while ago on YouTube, he was talking about multiple different things, but one of his points was the fact that he was speaking to pastors and he said, there are tasks that are meant for God and there are tasks that are meant for you. Find joy in that. The fact that God has certain things that he has set aside that only he can do, only he will do, and then there are the ones that he's given to us, that through his strength we will accomplish. And this is the idea that I may not understand that, I may not get everything in the scripture, but it doesn't change the fact that it is true. So back to this thing here, we have these two decisions now. You can either choose to accept the knowledge that you gain, as that young man did at Awana, so he, he can believe this knowledge and gain it, and you can have this relationship with him, or you cannot. One or the other. The, the, the outcome, though, of the faith is that idea that you now know God. You experience him. You, we have genosco with him. There's this intimacy of this relationship, this experiencing him, this loving God that we're introduced to in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. It's more than this head knowledge than the Pharisees had. Remember, because he called them whitewashed tombs, empty cups. This idea that they were cleaning the outside of the cup but not the inside because they knew all the knowledge, they had all the right answers, they were checking the list, they had this prescription faith, this pharisaical faith, but they didn't necessarily know God. They missed him. Even Paul, it's beautiful because we see here, Paul, in Galatians, he defends himself at the very beginning. It's Paul's personal defense of the gospel, Paul's personal defense of himself. And we see this idea that Paul was like, he was homeboy. He was Cliff Kingsbury or whoever else is good, whatever analogy you want to use. He was the top dog when it came to knowing stuff about the law. He knew it all. He had grown up in it. He had memorized it. He was like sought after. He was a teacher. He crucified Christians. He was like, yeah, man, it's Paul. Paul knows what he's talking about. Paul knew, had knowledge about God, but he didn't know him. Then the Damascus Road comes along, he gets sideswiped by the Lord, and now he knows him. And so this is why he's presenting it to the Corinthians and to the Galatians, because he understands it, he gets it. He's like, wait, wait, hold on, you don't understand. I had knowledge about God, I knew everything about him, I had all the scriptures memorized, I had experienced him, I had learned about him, I had gone to Sunday school, but I didn't know God. Don't go back to this way of knowledge. Don't go back to this way of dissension a bunch of yourselves. Don't try and find Jesus plus something. It's not Jesus plus knowledge that equals salvation. It's Jesus plus nothing that equals salvation. This is the idea of the relationship with the Father that we talked about in John 17, 3. So to go back to the testimony, we left our young man in the CAT scan. CAT scan comes out. There's enough contrast inside of him to find that infection was ravaging his body. They have found that uh, his appendix had ruptured. They suspected it ruptured on a Friday, so it would have been like four days earlier. The nurse told him uh, that same moment, um, you should have died 48 hours ago. That's comforting news. I hope no one ever tells me that. And so then he goes into the hospital. He's passing out every now and then. The doctor comes in on a Wednesday and he says, we're going to do laparoscopic, which means tiny scar, less problems with your older. You'll be out in a couple days. So the young man threw up on him. <laughs> and the doctor said, okay, we're going to go into surgery right now. And after an intense, long surgery, he gains a nine-inch scar and two weeks in the hospital where he can't move, he can't eat, he can't drink, he can't do anything. And keep in mind, this is the young man who went to church all the time, was super popular, knew the word, who loved the Lord, who served him, who was winning all the awards and everything, and he's angry with God. Why are you doing this to me? Do you know who I am? I serve you, I love you, I know about you. Why are you doing this to me? Well, he had no choice but to sit in the hospital for two weeks and to talk about the scriptures and to read the word, which is what he did. Talked to his parents, talked to his youth pastor, read the book of Job. Job 13, 14, 13, 15 says, though he slay me, yet I trust him. It's a verse that he found and it kind of rocked him to his core. He started understanding that this was a two by four to the face, so to say, from the Lord. That he was walking along, minding his own business. God wind up and went, what? and knocked him flat on his face and rocked everything he thought he knew about faith. 
This is the moment he likes to say that his prescription faith became a passionate faith. That what he watched in his parents was starting to take root in his own life. That he now loved the Lord and knew the Lord and wanted to know him more and it became an obsession rather than something he just had to do. And so coming out of that, he still couldn't march or anything, so he, he just went back to school. He even missed a lot of school. He, he tried going back to the church, but then nothing really kind of clicked again. But he started understanding the scripture and started opening up his word every day, not out of a sense of obligation, but out of a sense of obsession and a sense of addiction, out of a sense of wanting to know more about God. Because the, the trick is, y'all, when we know God, that's when he calls us towards this knowledge of him. Because you know God, you love God, and when you want to know God, you want to know more about him. And when you know more about him, you love him more because you're, you're starting to understand him more and have this relationship with him more, and you're growing in that, which makes you, want, you, makes you know him more. And, and because you know him more, you want to know about him more. And it's just this endless cycle of loving the Lord and knowing him and growing in him every single moment after every single moment of every single day. And so this was this moment of passion for this young man as he started growing up. He started becoming involved in the church even more, gained some titles, had some opportunities to preach and teach, started looking at colleges, came to Texas Tech, involved in Texas Tech for a good few years, and started really loving it, eventually found his way towards Paradigm, where eventually he found himself as the university intern for First Baptist, which if you haven't put two and two together yet, that young man was me. My life was a life of knowledge when I was young that I thought I knew God because I could answer some Bible trivia. I thought I knew God based off the amount of patches on my Awana vest. I thought I knew God because when I went to camp, I had gotten there free because I brought so many visitors. Which when you went to a Christian elementary school and whatnot was rather easy. Hey, come to camp, you'll come with me to church, you'll get $50 off your camp. Parents say, yes, go. That was my story. But see, the, the, the flip end of that now is this idea that I feel like I now know God and you experience him. Do I understand everything about him? No. But you grow in your knowledge of him as you grow in, your, in knowing him and your relationship with him and experiencing him. This is what college has been for me for the past four years. Every lesson learned, every mistake made, every, every lesson I learned from mistakes, every lesson I've refused to learn from mistakes, has been another moment of God teaching me and growing me and calling, to him, calling me to him more and more so that we may know one another and have this knowledge together with one another. So then here's, here's the invitation and the application of all this. Two questions. First question. Do you know God? Do you know him? Do you have that gnosko with him, that experiential relationship with him? Do you have that intimacy with him? Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. I think this is one of the most terrifying passages of Scripture. That there's this person who preached the gospel, drove out demons, did miracles, did all these good deeds, and then comes to the moment, comes to the pearly gates and says, Hello, I'm here. And he says, I never knew you. This is that Bible Belt religiosity that John always warns about. This is the idea that you can have knowledge. You can go to church. You can even serve in the church. You can even work in the church as an intern. And you can never know God. Because you have this surface level head knowledge of this idea that because I know about God, I know God, and therefore I'm okay. But then we go home on a Tuesday. We go home after paradigm. We do whatever it is we want to do because it doesn't matter on Thursday nights what we do. As long as on Sunday we're at Life Group, on Tuesday we're at CG, and on Thursday nights we're at paradigm. This is what I live my life. This is something I still struggle with today. The idea that your faith in Christ is something that you take on your way out the door when you grab your keys, jacket, and hat. But that's not it. It's not playing church. It's not about the games. It's not about the actions. It's not prescription faith. The scary moment here is that mention of the good deeds here. 
but it's a heart, it's a heart change to truly know God. It's that heart change. Some of us think that because I know about God, I have purchased fire insurance, but then whenever a fire really comes, we go to use that insurance and there's nothing there because we truly don't know God. Do you know God? Do you have a relationship with him? Or are you like me, living a prescription faith, thinking that popping the pills of devotion and praying before I ate was experiencing the Lord and having a relationship with him. Was it, was that was living passionately for him. That wasn't passion. That was passivity. I wasn't actively living my faith. So some of you are in that boat. Some of you are sitting here, and maybe that's been you. I hope not. Maybe you've grown up in the church, and you've known the, known the scriptures and everything, but you never really had that moment of, I know God. And so some of you in the moment, the altar will be open. We'll have time to respond. You'll have time to pray with those around you, to come ask questions, to think about this, talk about this, to come up and just to talk about that if you want to. That's the salvation moment, this presentation, that it's not necessarily knowing about God. It's that you have to know him and have that experiential relationship with him. The other side, the other side of the coin is that you do know God. You may be sitting here and I know God. And so my question for you then is, what are you known by? What are you known for? When John asked me to speak tonight, he kind of presented it as like a senior swan song kind of an idea. You know, your chance to teach on the four years that you learned in college. He's like, yeah, summarize four years of college in 30 minutes. I was like, uh, uh, go to class? (laughs) Just kidding, who goes to class? (laughs) I go to class. I skipped one class. It was stats my freshman year. I'm still, I still, I, I feel so guilty. I don't, I did not like that class. Anyways, what are you known by? What are you known for? Proverbs 20, 11 says this, every young man is known by his actions and his behavior, if his behavior is pure and upright, or in the ESV, even a child makes himself known by his acts, by whether his conduct is pure and upright. You are known by what you do. You are known by what you say. You are known by your fruit. This is a concept we see throughout the gospels. It, before, the, before the passage we just read in Matthew 7, 20 through 20, 21 through 23, we see 15 through 20 says this, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but are inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. You will recognize by your fruits. You will recognize by what you are known by. How many seniors do I have in the room? Seniors graduating in like 20 days. Awesome. Congratulations. We're done. Some of us. Our legacy, what we're known by, that's done. We have 10 days. We have 20 days. You can't change your legacy of four years in a week. So we're going to leave from here, and we're going to leave behind our friends and our family here, and when they hear your name, they're going to think of a certain thing. Whether it was a memory, something you said, something you did. I hope that it's a warm one, whether it's a fun memory, maybe it's a funny moment of something silly you did, but, but they will think of something. The people that you had in your class, even though they may not know you that well, they still will know that there's something to you, something about you. I have this perception of you, and so when I hear your name, something comes to mind. So what are you known by? What is your legacy? For the rest of y'all who are staying here at Tech for a little while, this kind of applies to you, is that you have this opportunity to shape your legacy and to shape what you're known by. By your actions, by your posting on Facebook, by what you Snapchat, by, by what you say and what you do, you can point to the one that you are known by by revealing what you are known by and what you are known for. This is just an example of living the Christian faith, living this passionate faith. That this constant thing, this passionate faith is not a prescription thing for you. That is a real thing. You know God, you love God, you are known by him and you want others to know that you are known by God and that you know him. You have a chance to do that. I pray that this is something that you're already doing something that your legacy is already striving to be, that even though I will be gone in 10 days, y'all won't remember my name in a few years, but you'll remember what I say today, is that you need to be known by God. I pray that you will be known by God. God wants you to be known by him, and that others will see that you are known by him as well. 
Because the other side of all this is you can be known by God. You can have knowledge about him and you can know God, but you can't bottle that up inside. Because if you are, then I have a question on whether you are truly known by him in the first place. For if you are passionate about the scriptures and you know about God and you know God and you know that God has known you, then you will have no choice to be salt and light to the earth. It will shine bright from you. It's not something, and this is college, y'all. You guys are the ones that you get to decide if you want to come to Paradigm every day, you, to every Thursday. <laughs> every day, wow, that'd be more crazy. You get to decide if you want to come to church on Sunday mornings. Your parents aren't here waking you up. They aren't calling you, and if they are, you can put it on silent and put it away. Don't do that, answer. Your, if your mom calls, answer. But you can decide. You have a choice now. You're your own person. This is when faith, and I want to commend you, y'all are here, so you, I'm preaching to the choir, because you know, you're here. But we're about to leave for summer, where we won't have paradigm. If you're here, we'll have some Bible studies, you'll hear about those in a few minutes. If you're not, you're going home. I don't know what your home life is like, but this community isn't here, and that's when it gets really hard to continue to live that passionate faith, because those that know you here aren't there, and so you can start slacking off, you can start leaving your, you know, your faith jacket at home, and you can turn away and turn off that passionate faith. That's not how it works. So I want to encourage you in that. I want to encourage you to, if you, are, if you are known by God, then live for Him. Make others know that you are known by Him. And if you aren't known by God, then come talk to us. Come up to the front, talk to somebody. Let's talk through that. I want to encourage you in that and we'll walk through that and see what that means because I was there. I know what it's like to have this knowledge about God but never really experience Him. It's an empty shell. It's fire insurance without really having fire insurance. It's like picking up the phone to call 911 and no one's on their way. And so these next few moments, I hope that those two questions bounce around in your mind. Do you know God in our, if you do know him, what do you know by? I'm going to pray and as Johnny and the band come on up and we'll have this moment to respond. There is freedom in this room, y'all. If you want to come forward and pray on these steps, if you want to talk to somebody, if you want to ask someone to pray for you, you can do that. That goes for every paradigm, by the way. You can come forward and pray on this altar. No one's going to judge you for it. No one's going to think, oh, so-and-so went forward. They must, they must be a really bad person. That's not what they're thinking because they hopefully are thinking about their own selves. But I encourage you, if that's something you want to do, if you want to come forward and talk to and pray to, we'll be here. But take these few moments to really self-assess. What am I known by? What am I known for? And do I know the Lord? Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this moment tonight that we can come together as a body, as a um, as paradigm, as college students who love you, God, who want to know you and know more about you and experience you and have this relationship with you, Father, that we can come and we can experience you, Father. I pray tonight that as, uh, this audience is wrestling their questions on whether they are truly known by God or, or whether if they are, what are they known by, God, that they will just have clarity from you, the sense of peace from you. God, the enemy is going to want us just to settle for good. Settle for knowledge and not actually experience you. Settle for this moment where it's all head, but it's no action. Where our heart and our mind are disagreeing with one another. As David wrestled in Psalms 42, God, may we just have this passion for you. Not a prescription faith, Father. Not a head filled knowledge, Father. But where we know you and know you intimately. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this week's Time in the Word and look forward to seeing you next time. Check us out online at www.930.org and have a great day.